You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for Social Storytelling and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we're going to be talking about the solutions table, which we've done some solution table review. This is for transitional movement assessments, postural assessments, and and so this one today is going to be on the anterior pelvic tilt. Anterior pelvic tilt. So what is an anterior pelvic tilt? And then we can kind of get into why we're trying to address it. But let's talk about what it is and why people have trouble sometimes remembering why anterior pelvic tilt is anterior. All right. So one of the issues is, well, a pelvic tilt is the pelvis sits on top of the femurs. So as you're standing upright, the pelvis is seated on top of the femurs. And I think what happens when we say an anterior pelvic tilt is when we go into it, our butt goes backwards and the top of our pelvis tilts forward. But the point of reference is a little off sometimes where when you stick your backside out, then it makes your posterior a bit more prominent. But that doesn't make it a posterior pelvic tilt. So the issue is the point of reference. The point of reference isn't the backside. The point of reference is the top of the pelvis. And some people, you may have heard this, is that think of the pelvis as a bucket. And if the bucket is filled with water, if you stick the backside out, the water spills towards the anterior. It spills towards the front. That is an anterior pelvic tilt. That is an anterior water spillage. And so it helps to remember, think about the top of the pelvis like a bucket. And as the pelvis shifts forward like a bucket on top of the femurs, as the femurs stick into the side of that bucket and they can posterior or anterior go back or forward as the top of the pelvis, the top of the pelvis is your point of reference. As the top of the pelvis shifts forward, the posterior, the backside, starts to stick out backwards. And so anyway, the point of reference is important here that helps you understand an anterior pelvic tilt. Now, I know that it's it's also easy sometimes to think of it in terms of this. A, an anterior pelvic tilt is hip flexion. But a lot of times as we do hip flexion, we keep the pelvis stable and we bring the femur up to the pelvis and go, oh, that's hip flexion. We stand maybe on one leg and we pull our knee up towards our chest and we say, okay, that's hip flexion, all right? So we're seated in a chair and our pelvis is still in that neutral position maybe, and we are in a hip flexed position. Well, that's because the femurs are moving. Well, this is an example of not femur to pelvis flexion, but this is an example of pelvis on femur flexion. So the pelvis rocks forward and creates hip flexion. Now, in most cases, when this happens, posturally speaking, the pelvis shifts forward and then we arch our back so that we can stand up straight. And that creates a significant anterior pelvic tilt with an increased lumbar lordosis. That's what's most commonly seen. However, I was on the train one time and there was a woman who was getting off the train and I saw her stand up, but she stayed bent over to grab her bag. And then she threw her bag over her shoulder, didn't stand up any straighter and walked out. She looked like an old miner the way that she was walking in that bent over position. And I thought, my goodness, that is a lot of pelvis on femur hip flexion because that's how biomechanic nerds think when they see things like that. Join me. Join me. Join the dark side of biomechanic nerdism. What commonly happens there, though, is that people arch their back Still, it's hard to get out of that anterior tilt position if you're stuck in it, so they arch their back to stand more upright. All right, and miners don't do that because then they bump their head on the cave or the mine, and so they have to stay bent over. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is clearly there's hip flexion 
typically accompanied by spinal extension. And usually the pelvis is flexed forward on the femur, the pelvic on fem pelvis on femur flexion. Usually then in order to be upright, the spine is extended, which creates a significant arch in the back. So let's get into a better understanding of what's going on here. So let's look at our solutions table. Now the solutions table, according to our corrective exercise manual, uh, you're going to be looking at, and this is a table 13.5 in the corrective exercise course, and let's just talk it out for a moment. We know, and you may not know, but here are the phases of the corrective exercise model that NASM has. The corrective exercise model are going to be inhibit, lengthen, activate, and integrate. Well, here's the thing. A lot of times you're going to get um, even sometimes therapists get really focused on just one thing. So sometimes, uh, uh, let's say a massage therapist, they're really focused on the inhibit, the hands-on stuff. Now, this is not what we're even talking about, but the hands-on stuff. Look at all the inhibit, 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 which is great, except a lot of times it does not include lengthening, nor activation, nor integration. Sometimes a physical therapist may focus a little more on inhibiting, may focus a little more on activation. You may not see as much lengthening or integration, and, that, and that's okay, but it's just a part of the corrective exercise model that NASM subscribes to, that they put forth. And so here's what this might look like if you have a corrective exercise program for somebody that has an anterior pelvic tilt. Now, we're not doing hands-on stuff, so the first thing we're going to look at is what is the modality that we're going to use in order to inhibit the muscles? And the modality we look at is something we refer to as self-myofascial rolling, or SMR, or simply called foam rolling sometimes. And so we take that roller, whatever it is, whether it's foam, whether it's a uh, a water bottle, whether it's a, a lacrosse ball, it doesn't matter. We're just utilizing a tool and we want to use a tool specifically designed as a physical therapist. You need to use a tool specifically designed for foam rolling. Here's why. If anybody gets hurt, let's say you did do it, say, okay, we foam rolled on a water bottle and they got hurt. And then they will say, was that foam, was that water bottle designed for self myofascial rolling? And when, the moment you say no, litigation complete, and they win. So let's use something designed for self-myofascial rolling. So we'll use some type of rolling tool that's designed for it. And here are the muscles that you're going to look at rolling as a corrective exercise strategy for an excessive anterior pelvic tilt. One, you're going to look at foam rolling, the rectus femoris or the rectus femoris. The rectus femoris is a hip flexor. What it does is the pelvis that's sitting on top of the, uh, the femurs, it attaches to the front of it and pulls it down, which creates an anterior pelvic tilt. So the femur does hip flexion. It can do hip flexion by pulling the femur towards the pelvis. Or if you're standing, as it tightens, it will pull the pelvis into a tilt anteriorly towards the femur. Well, another muscle that can do that on the anterior side is the TFL. Well, that's a muscle that is really sensitive to self myofascial rolling and something that should probably be addressed. It pulls down, it pulls inferiorly on the anterior side of the pelvis. So it creates an anterior pelvic tilt. Now, we got something else. The lats on the posterior side pull up. So... A couple muscles on the front pulling the pelvis down on the front and the lats pulling up on the back or the posterior side helps to create that anterior pelvic tilt. Now, there are more muscles that are involved here, but these are the ones that we can get to for the self-myofascial rolling. So what you're going to do is you're going to roll that area and you're going to look for areas of discomfort. Areas of discomfort, hold it for 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Important to note. If it pulses, numbs, tingles, or shoots, get off of it. You got to get off those points if you feel any of those, and you're going to perform these little holds on sensitive areas from four to six repetitions in order to get some better joint movement. Or you can do 90 seconds to 120 seconds per muscle group, and then moving right along.
we'll get on to the next one. So now that's inhibit. Let's lengthen. What are we going to link? Well, first of all, how? What's the modality we're going to use to lengthen the muscle? In this particular instance, it's going to be static stretching. In static stretching, we are now going to foam. Uh, so static stretch the the hip flexor complex. So the major hip flexors, the iliacus and the psoas. But Rick, we're supposed to SMR those things first. Well, you can't. You can't get to them. They're inside, deep inside the abdominal region. You're not foam rolling your psoas. But you can stretch it. So we're going to do that hip flexor complex by maybe doing, I like doing a kneeling hip flexor stretch because that stretches the rectus femoris in addition to the iliacus and the psoas muscles. We're going to hold a static stretch for how long? I know you're thinking it. What do you have? You got it, 30 seconds. We're going to hold it for 30 seconds. And then we can move on to the next muscle. That muscle I would suggest being the latissimus dorsi. The latissimus dorsi on the posterior side as the arms go up overhead, it's going to stretch the lats. And then in order to better stretch it, if it pulls into an anterior tilt to help shorten, then we're going to want to posterior tilt in order to lengthen that muscle a little bit more. We can also laterally flex away from the arm. Let's say I'm stretching my right lat. I'm going to laterally flex my hips away from the right side, so towards the left side, to get even deeper into that stretch. And we can hold that static stretch for 30 seconds. And you can do a few sets of 30 seconds as well. You can static stretch also your erector spinae. I find a lot of people actually, though, don't have... Um, stretching the erector spinae doesn't actually do a lot, but you can spinal flex. You can do spinal flexion. And if you feel a stretch in your erector muscles, they are definitely tight. But most people, what limits them in spinal flexion isn't the erectors. It is actually just the structure of the spine itself. All right, so that's inhibit and lengthen. Now we're going to move on to activate. And activate, the modality we're going to use is isolated strengthening. So we're going to do some isolated strengthening for the abdominal complex, particularly the stabilizers in the abdominal complex. Because what's happening is we've got uh, an anterior pelvic tilt, and in order to maintain neutral spine, we may not necessarily need rectus abdominis to be stronger, though that could be highly indicated on the list. But we may also really need just spinal stability, the ability to stabilize the spine, and for those paraspinal muscles, the intervertebral spinal muscles to stabilize one vertebra stacked on top of another one, so they stabilize there. So those would be the paraspinal muscles like the, the, the multifidus muscles, all right? The rotatories, the transversus spinalis. Well, how do we activate those? Well, those would be exercises where we might do things like dead bugs. We do things like the bird dog exercise, which is kind of like a dead bug, except you start off on all fours and you reach opposite arm and leg away. A dead bug exercise is where you're lying uh, face up, you're lying supine with bent knees, uh, bent hips 90-90, opposite arm and legs reaching away. And in both of these, they're reaching long. They're not necessarily reaching up, but there's how long can you reach and still maintain spinal stability? Here's the other thing. A lot of times when you work spinal stabilizers, it doesn't feel very abby. I don't feel a lot of abs. Well, that's good. In fact, a lot of times when you work spinal stabilizers, uh, it, 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 it should be relatively light, relatively, um, not say necessarily easy, but as soon as it starts getting more and more challenging, the rectus abdominis starts to jump in and then that can become synergistically dominant. So we just don't want it to be such a challenging exercise that other muscles that aren't the stabilizers start to jump in. So other isolated strengthening muscle group you want to look at would be the gluteus maximus. If you are in a hip flexed position, that glute max is a very significant hip extensor that can be reciprocally inhibited by short, tight, overactive hip flexors. So we want to bring the glute max back into activity. 
So doing things, maybe I like this, going right from like a, a dead bug and a double leg heel tap or supine marching while lying down and then shifting right into a floor bridge in order to get the glutes to, to activate. And so here's a series that I like to do with that is the first one, I just have a bridge and hold. I love a bridge and hold maybe for about 30 seconds, a nice, uh, long, active stretch for the rectus femoris, for some of the hip flexors, and then you're squeezing the glutes and that, that whole time, and then go into repetitions, maybe 10 to 15 repetitions, nice and slow, with a focused glute contraction while dropping the backside down towards the floor and then bridging back up. Now that can be really challenging to maintain glute activation while going into hip flexion as you drop your backside out of that bridge position down towards the floor again. But that challenge is the challenge. Can you maintain glute activity even while you're hip flexed? And then hopefully now when you stand up, then you can maintain a bit more glute activity that is going to help stabilize your spine in uh, less of an anterior tilted position. So inhibit, lengthen, activate, and integrate. One of my favorite integration exercises is a squat to row, 10 to 15 repetitions, nice and slow, stay very controlled with the movement. And that way you're getting your upper body working with your lower body and your lumbopelvic hip complex has to stabilize and transfer forces from the lower body and the upper body, creating this integrated movement pattern. All right, that is a, uh, a brief synopsis of the lumbopelvic hip complex anterior pelvic tilt according to the solutions table that NASM has in the corrective exercise model. Now, are there more things that we can do? Yes. Sometimes I really work with people uh, on their addict adductors, especially their anterior adductors, which is everything except the posterior fibers of the adductor magnus and maybe their gracilis. Um, but I might go in for the adductors as well on some of these. So that might be in the inhibitory category and the lengthen category. Uh, for activation, you could also potentially add in things like your glute medius. I think these are all excellent sources and something that we can use to help better our um, training clients to support them in getting a more neutral position in their spine as they uh, stand statically or as they go through that transitional squat assessment, the overhead squat assessment, when you see the back arch, the low back arch. Anyway, like, subscribe, share with your fitness friends and family. You want to reach out to me, you can do that. Hit me up at rick.richie at nasm.org, or you can DM me on Instagram at dr.rickrichie. Y'all keep inspiring people to fitness. Thanks for listening. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.